Well, hello again, my friends. This is Kanita, and I greet you warmly, warmly in the name of our risen Lord on this beautiful Sunday morning. It appears it's going to be just a glorious day. They're talking about all sunshine, highs somewhere in the 60s, low 60s, mid 60s. What difference does it make? 60s at all in this part of the world in December is uh, is going to be a great day. <laughs> Well, my friends, I welcome you to the show this morning, to our second or third, I guess, on the uh, Blog Talk Radio. Uh, this will also, I will uh, post it over to the Pod- Podomatic site uh, sometime later in the day, because uh, there are still a great many of my listeners who uh, who don't know about this site or perhaps don't have access to it, so uh, I want to make sure that uh, these messages are shared in as many venues as uh as I can, because as all of us, I I understand the urgency of the times and the importance of the message. Well, my friends, in the Word of God this morning in the book of Micah, we see this phrase, the prophets who lead my people astray. Now, this is nothing new to us. We've seen this and heard this many times and seen people point it out and and mentioned to us, and we understand that Satan labors by false teachers who are his emissaries to deceive, to lewd, and forever steal and damn the souls of men. They seduce them and carry them away into paths and blind thickets of error and wickedness, where they wander in delusion and mostly are lost forever. Oh, my friends, as post prostitutes paint their faces, put on elegant attire and deck and perfume themselves in their beds, all the better to allure and deceive simple souls into coming into their parlor. So do false teachers put on fresh new coats of paint and sweet smelling flowers upon the loads of garbage, dung, and blasphemies that they spew out from behind their pulpits of desolation. You see, they know like everyone else the sugar-coated poison goes down sweetly. So they wrap up their treachery in soul-killing doses of the sweetest honey. Peace! Peace! They will say to you when there is no peace. No peace within their buildings. No peace in their soul. And if they have anything to do about it, no peace in yours. We see these false prophets everywhere in the organized churches. They come to you bouncing and happy, fresh from their seminaries and Bible schools. Humbly dressed in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves full of ambitions and their own plans. You see, they've got it all laid out. They understand they're to start out somewhere small and build and build, and then they incorporate their own ministries. And all of these things, all of these plans are serving themselves and not the body. They lick and suck the blood of souls to enrich themselves. They kiss and say they are going to make holy. But they kill and ravage. They cry salvation and safety to all who hear them right up until the time, almost the very instant, that these souls fall unknowingly into everlasting flames. My friends, these men are trained, trained in the handling of holy things. And they handle them well. They handle them with a trifling wit and dexterity that amazes all those around. Yet within their heart, there is no fear and reverence. They propound ideas, even crude and misleading ideas and doctrines concerning God, Christ, moral conditions and personal relationships. 
that are utterly inconsistent with the truth as God has revealed it to us in His written Word, His living Word, and His living Spirit. They make and use forms, rules, and sleight-of-hand tricks, and all the latest technology in their worship services to entertain and tickle the ears of their listeners, to expand, to grow, to widen their financial base, all to glory in the goodness of their own flesh and to share this glorying of man with all those who hear them. And they pay only small lip services to Almighty God in whose name they claim to speak. My friends, these are the sole scalpers of this present age. And they fill every organized, incorporated church in the land and across the world. Who are these people I'm speaking of, you ask? And that's a fair question. They are the barkers, the leaders, the heralds of formal religion and religious movements everywhere. They are the bishops, the cardinals, popes, the elders, the pastors. They are the Nicolaitans of Scripture. They are the hirelings and the miscreants. They are the wolves, lured, lured by the prospect of power, respectability, and riches within these institutions of religion. And they care only for themselves and their ambitions within these institutions. You see, once they become a part of an institution, it is the institution that draws their loyalty. And as, as we all know, as was demonstrated in the temptations of our lords, all organized institutions and power bases of any form anywhere on earth are all at the beck and call and control of Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air. And so it was within these institutions and through these institutions that they guide and direct people away from the living God and into the formalities of religion, the formalities of a religion that glorifies man glorifies creation that has bought the lie that all is one and all is within the creation that we see we are all a part of the one and therefore we are all God God within us this is the lie that they have sold within the institutions that they have built now there might be different variations and correlations along the way because they they cannot agree amongst themselves, so they have to have different denominational setups and different religious formalities. But the truth is, within all of these institutes and forms of religion, they eye control of your life more than they care for the saving of your life. They eye your goods more than the good of your soul. And they tend more to the serving of themselves than to the saving of your soul. To this end, they set up and give us structure, organization, and guidance. And it is here, right at the very core of their structures, that the perversion begins You see, my friends, our Lord, through His earthly ministry, through His apostles, and through His Spirit, 
did not bequeath us a religion. My goodness, he saw religions around him everywhere. If he would have wanted to start just another religion, he wouldn't have had to suffer, to die as a living sacrifice. He could have simply started it and watched it grow. It would have been accepted in with all of the other religions eventually. They all jockey and fight back and forth. But they understand the spirit of man is drawn to worship. And if he has nothing other than himself to worship, that is what he worships and that is the case. And the structure simply organizes and directs this worship of self to something that appears to be for the greater good. But you see, my friends, our Lord, through his earthly ministry, through his apostles, through his spirit, did not bequeath us a religion. He bequeathed us a living fellowship of relationship. Relationship with him. Relationship with Almighty God the Father. And relationship with all, with through it, with each other. There we go. Sometimes words are hard to get out. <laughs> and this relationship came with almost no structure. For he understood, as only the living God could, that structure destroys relationship. Because structure eliminates the need for relationship. You have formalities, rules, procedures, laws, all of these things set up that tend to dampen and smash relationship because relationship is individual and spontaneous. And that's the only way it can be. And our Lord understood that this is the only way His body would function in this living world and make a difference. It could only function in intimate, living loving personal relationship this is why the word speaks so harshly against the Nicolaitans in the book of Revelation for they destroy the ecclesia of almighty God through the bringing of structure in order to eliminate relationship you see, structure does not bother the powers of this world any. There are a million different kinds of structure. There are structures everywhere. Formal and informal. Structure doesn't bother them. Relationship. Relationship with the living God scares the pants off of them. And relationship with each other through the living God builds strength and power within the ecclesia of Almighty God. And this scares them even more, for it reminds them that there is an end and what their end will be. This is why our Lord speaks so harshly. This is why structure has been implanted and pounded into our brains so thoroughly and this is why the Lord says repeatedly come unto me come out from among them for only in him do we find relationship only at the hands of the hirelings do we see structure now it is fair to ask how this happened. And to understand that, we have to go back, back into the early history of the fellowships of our Lord, to the early, well, I don't like to use the word churches, but uh, the Bible uses the term, so I will, to the early churches, to their services of worship, and understand the nature of their worship service, and the intention and purpose of 
what has come to be known as the five called out ministries of the Spirit and how it operated among them. This being apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. But I see our time is getting short here. It looks like I perhaps bought into more than than I could chew this morning for a half-hour show. I guess that's good news. The last couple times I've had some difficulty getting to a half an hour. But I will take this over into a part two and post it sometime during the week here and and sometime later today on the uh, podcast. But let me set the groundwork first for where we need to go to understand what has happened, when it happened, and, well, of course, we've already seen why it happened. The early church, the early fellowships and services were not worship services as we understand them, those of us that have been exposed to the church. They were much more like fellowships. They met in homes. They met mainly for a better part of an entire day. And there were offices within the church, but these offices were not formal and were not paid. And the office we're going to talk about is pastor. And to understand the perversion of this office, I must first explain to you the function of a pastor in the early church. And this will just about end the time that I have here, and we will have to carry on later. Uh, Although I will spend some time in the chat room to answer any questions and perhaps explain more of this to you there if there are any of you in the chat room. (laughs) It's kind of new for that sort of thing, I guess. But the pastor in the early church was a part of the ministry, but he was not necessarily a speaker at the worship services. That was not his function. He was a shepherd. In the early church, traveling evangelists, apostles, prophets, ministers traveled throughout the land and they stopped by the individual fellowships and shared as God had led them to share. The office of the pastor was one of a shepherd. The pastor was the one chosen to go out into the homes of the flock, to get to know the flock by name, to see their problems, see how they lived, encourage them, develop their faith, Disciple, that's the word I was looking for, to disciple them into the faith and lead them to a pure understanding of our Lord and the truth he gave us. The pastor did not stand up and preach before the church. The pastor did not interpose himself between a congregation and our living Lord. The pastor was a shepherd on earth to guard and protect and encourage and feed the flocks of our Lord. This is what he did. It was not a paid staff position. It was a position thought highly of because of the lowness and the humbleness humbleness of the work involved. The pastor's job was to love the flock, encourage the flock, and feed the flock. It was not his job to choose the direction the flock would go. It was not his job to lead the flock out of the gates the Lord had set up for them. Well, I was going to begin going on into the next section, but perhaps that's not a good idea I can see I only have a minute left here uh, because of the uh, the music that I've put in. But let me suffice it to say that in the next episode we will discuss how this idea was formed within the early church of structure, of an organized ministry, of a priesthood, so to speak. And it came from within the very body of Christ itself. As our Lord said, that the leaven is already in the loaf. Much as Judas was among the twelve, there was a seed of evil among the seven chosen by the apostles in the book of Acts. 
And according to the early church writers, uh, Epiphanius, uh, Tertullian especially, and Polycarp, the man's name was Nicholas of Tarsus. And it was he. Well, perhaps I should leave it there. We're running out of time now. I will uh, answer questions and, and, and see you in the chat room here in just a few minutes. And uh, I will try and put the rest of this together sometime later today or as soon as I can to get, to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm running out of breath, get the second half up and for you. Until the next time, my friends, have a wonderful, wonderful day in our risen Lord. All praise and honor and glory go to him. Amen. Goodbye.